Greetings. Well, here we go again. This, we are delighted to have the Danish quartet, the Danish string quartet, and they are actually Danish. <laughs> so that's exciting. <laughs> um, I'm so amazed that so many of you made it through this weather with the power outages and the tough lecturer audience. Yes. And it's very exciting. In fact, it made me want to start the lecture by telling you a, a true story about Beethoven that has snow and ice and rain in it <coughs> and relates to this piece. You know, Beethoven, of course, spent a lot of time courting the aristocracy and with princes. And one of the great stories, I love this story, is Prince Lichnowsky, who was one of his great patrons and uh, somebody who really deeply admired Beethoven, threw open his home to him, but also invited him to his country estate. And after the invasion of Austria by Napoleon, where there were French soldiers everywhere, it was not very pleasant to be in Vienna for a lot of people, and especially Beethoven wanted to go out and be away from it all and, and compose. So Lichnowsky invited him to his estate in Gretz, and which is in Silesia. And Beethoven enjoyed living there for a while. And then one evening, some French officers came to dinner. Now, you probably know that uh, war and invasions, et cetera, were different then for the upper classes than for the lower classes. <laughs> so if you were a member of the aristocracy, while everybody else was uh, tr uh, having their troubles and could, there could be bombs dropping or fighting in a battlefield, you could have dinner with the enemy as long as you were of a certain class. <laughs> and so Beethoven was outraged. Now, of course, Beethoven was easily outraged, but this was <laughs> outrageous. I mean, you've got to give him this one. So first of all, he was outraged because of these people. But then beyond that, the prince did the one thing that always made Beethoven furious, which was he asked him to play the piano for the French officers even worse. <laughs> so what would you do? <laughs> That's the, we always, in America, we always say, what would somebody do? We never know. Uh, the answer. But basically, <laughs> Beethoven stormed out. He took some of the music he was working on with him, and he stormed out to walk away. I think probably we can safely assume that he forgot how far he was from anywhere else, <laughs> and that he didn't realize it was snowing. I could just see them, him, you know, him screaming, and we know what he screamed. You probably know it too, it's famous. Prince, what you are by, or you are by accident of birth. You know this quote? What I am, I am through my own efforts. There have been thousands of princes and will be thousands more. There is only one Beethoven. <laughs> and that's a great way to leave, you know. Uh, I don't think Lichnowsky said, there's only one Lichnowsky. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, then he walked out, slammed the door in the rain and the snow and all the terrible weather that he apparently had, which we know partly from letters and partly that the score, uh, not yet finished to the Appassionata Sonata, was just almost ruined by the weather, but uh, it was still usable. <laughs> so there you have a story, not only about rain and sleet and ice pellets and snow, but about Beethoven and about his rage, and also about injustice, because he lived at a time, unlike ours, <laughs> where injustice, <laughs> injustice was everywhere. That's the joke. <laughs> um, and basically, uh, of course, the society was so stratified that you had to establish yourself in some way or you would just be, uh, live the worst possible life. In fact, it, one of the interesting things about it, reverse from, let's say, New York, is that the aristocracy, when there was a big building, lived on the ground floor. And the peasants, or the, not the peasants, but the poor people lived up higher because they had to walk out up, up and down the stairs. Now we would probably reverse that, right? Okay. Anyway. But, you know, Beethoven wanted to be and pretended for a while that he was a member of the aristocracy, especially when he was in court fighting over his uh, nephew, Carl, who he almost was able to get custody of. Um, he called himself, it was an accident at first, but he kept to it, he called himself Ludwig von Beethoven instead of Van Beethoven. And that doesn't mean that he just wanted to have fun. It means, that's a terrible joke, I know, fun, just wanted to have fun, as in fun, okay. <laughs> They didn't get it over here, so. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, he went with it until it was shown in court that he was Van, not Fun, and not a member of the aristocracy. Now, if you can imagine the rage 
and what it takes to put the rage in music. Nobody really put this kind of anxiety and personal rage in music until Beethoven. But he also had a kind of reality in, in the music. So you could hear in, in the opening of this piece, if you wanted to, to have a program, which it doesn't, but if you wanted it to have a story, you could hear the outrage at Prince Lichnowsky, and you could also hear him trying to calm Beethoven down and it not working. Or you could also hear something that relates to Coriolan, his overture, and Egmont, the overture, and Fidelio, all of which are about prisoners, all of which are about oppression, rulers, invaders, and Beethoven lived that story with Napoleon. Don't forget, he, he thought Napoleon was a great hero. He changed his mind. The story of him ripping up the page is not true. It's very good. It's very Hollywood. People believed it for a while. That turns out not to be true. How do we know he never ripped it up? We still have the page. <laughs> uh, but he did write a different dedication on, on the Eroica Symphony after that. He, he still said it was for a great man, but he changed who the great man was in order to get a bigger commission. So it really had very little to do with Napoleon in the end. Practical stuff. Anyway, the opening of this piece is full of Beethoven's rage, or, or what rage is for all of us, and it also has this ex extremely amazing way of trying to calm down that rage. Now, that's easy to hear. You don't ha necessarily have to go to a lecture to have someone, even me, tell you that the opening sounds, it's full of rage. I am going to go through this in great detail until you know so much about the piece you can't even stand it. <laughs> but first, let's hear the opening, let's say up until the end of bar 39. Great place to stop. We're in the wrong key. <laughs> We're at a precipice. It's terrifying. Okay. Um, thank you. This is going to be great. Um, now, <clears throat> the opening right away has some very Beethovenian things, which are this silence, for example, right after the outburst. But in some kinds of silences, you have a sense of a rhetorical statement, something you're going to explore. This is not so much that, because it, this is so full of rage and passion that it doesn't seem like just a statement. But think about, for example, earlier Beethoven, the first quartet. You want to play the first quartet? Anyway, uh, you know how it opens, right? We have silence there, too. And it starts on F. Now, there's a similarity, but Beethoven has come a long way in terms of looking at the human soul and looking at the emotions of a person from this somewhat refined, elegant, beautiful, and classically designed, symmetrically balanced <laughs> statement with its silences to this outburst. And this outburst also is not answered by more of the same. And then it's answered by something else because it's really in conflict. Now, before I get into that, the actual piece, an underlying thought often is, does music actually say anything about anything else but itself? And this comes up all the time. In other words, if we say it's about oppression, how is that possible? If we say it's about jail or an invasion, uh, we can believe it, but is music capable of that? And I want to take a look at the very opening of uh, the Coriolan Overture, just for a moment, which is for orchestra, but just because 
it shows in the simplest possible way how it's possible to say something very specific with the right notes. Uh, it began, this is the overture, it starts like this. It's in, the, it's in C minor. It is clear as can be that you have something that will not leave, that is, you're trying to either escape or that's in, in your face, basically, that is the note C. And the three chords move further and further away from the key in, in an exact proportion. The first one is in the key. So if you think of it as an attempt to escape the key, the second one has moved a key a fifth higher. And the next one has moved a fifth higher than that. See what I mean? It's actually trying to get away, and it doesn't. So for Beethoven, the sense that a, a something means something specific, it doesn't mean that every uh, choice of a specificity is correct, but that the idea is that the, the movement of the tones and the relationships of the keys is, is really meaningful, whether we ever find exactly what that meaning is but we feel exactly how true and profound it is, even if we can't identify it exactly. So it does help, you see, to know something about his life, to know what he went through. You could say this is about his deafness. I couldn't say you were wrong. You could say it is about his troubles trying to find a wife. It seems a little violent for that, but maybe, <laughs> maybe possible. Uh, it, it, you know, when he, the rest of that story is after he left and walked through the rain and the snow, he finally made it back to Vienna a few days later. And when he walked into his own apartment, which was owned by the prince, there's a bust of Prince Lichnowsky that he picked up, Beethoven picked up, and hurled across the room, and it smashed into pieces. Could you just play uh, in the same section, right before bar 39, let's, let's pick the... Oh... Are 34 to 39, and I think you can hear a tremendous, uh, almost like a spasm, uh, uncontrollable, violent urge, which then is released in the key change. That's pretty close to, <laughs> to pictorial. Now, I want to go back to the beginning and take a look at some of the details that you're going to hear because one of the things that happens in this piece is very compressed. The first movement is only four minutes long. Many of Beethoven's movements, first movements, are eight minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes long, 15 minutes long. This is four. In this compressed movement, there are more key changes, more, and what, what does it mean to have more key changes? I mean, but there's more of that than in, in almost anything he wrote up to this point, for sure. What does it mean to have more key, ch key changes? Well, that's more instability, or I should say less stability. Each key change is a major departure of location. If you're in F minor, um, which we are, if we're in F minor, and we end up here, which is just where we were, this is hugely far. And eventually, that's very far away. We also end up in D, we end up in G, we end up in these keys that are very far away. It's possible to hear this as an attempt, like in Coriolan Overture, to escape F minor, as if F minor were suffocating uh, in some way, suffocating and enraging, and the only way is to try to burst out of the key. That's a possibility. Um, now, I don't know if Beethoven thought about it that way, but it sure feels like it. But I do know how he thought about the notes. So we can do some of that too. So if, you're a, if you like the metaphors, great. If you want to hear the notes, we're going to do that. We'll start with some of that right now. <laughs> okay, so for example, <coughs> for Beethoven and for a composer, this opening phrase <laughs> has one, if, if that's going to be the focus of the piece, of the first movement, among other things, aside from the rhythm, that's obvious. It has something strange in it, which is this. All 
it is really is there's F minor has two basic scales, or three really, but one like this, and on the way down, that's really all that is. But it's not all, it's not all it is when in this piece. That's two versions of the scale with the lowered flat uh, six and seven and raised. But this becomes an obsession of Beethoven. It's like the DNA. Now, if, if you think I'm getting extreme, hang in there. <laughs> I can prove this to a point where I would, I would do it in court. <laughs> that he's completely obsessed with this. And I would do it in the aristocratic courts as Bruce Fun Adel. <laughs> okay, but anyway, um, the very next thing we hear, the first violin does, here it is. It's it'll start to sound like Bartok in a minute, because Beethoven is obsessed with this whole step, half step. Uh, I'll show you how many places, it's, it's endless. Take a, let's hear, for example, in the, in the quartet, could you play just the first violin slowly, bar 36, a little slower than normally? Yeah. Okay, did you hear that? There it is again. And in fact, it's also in this tune in the viola. Now, it's, it's a small thing, but it gives an inkling of the keys to come, the, the harmonic changes that come. Uh, <clears throat> what I think I'll do is I'll, I will point out every time we hit one of those, I'll let you know. But the spot right there in the first filing, wouldn't you say that that is one of the stranger things you've ever played by Beethoven or Haydn or Mozart? That passage and that... <laughs> Can we play that passage again from uh, 34 and stop at 30, end of 37? Yeah, now that, it's extremely awkward. It's probably the kind of thing that the very first first violinist to play it, Schupanzig, complained about. It goes by really fast, it's extremely awkward, you can hardly hear it, why is it there? And you know Beethoven's comment to Schupanzig was, do you think I give a damn about your stupid fiddle when the muse strikes? <laughs> um, but why does he do it? This, if I slow it down, and it's this fast, right? It's just, it's ridiculous. Because Beethoven is nothing if not uh, in fully, uh, in, in, the word is, uh, he has great integrity. He has nothing if not integrity. And basically, you have that little DNA of this weird half step that he discovers in this passage. And he puts it every time there's a, he can really. And in the tune, sometimes it's inverted. And here, and it allows him to move into all these half-step areas. OK, so I will go back to that as it happens. So we also have, in that same passage before I leave it, a rhythmic strangeness, which is a kind of realism that you only find, for the first time you find it in Beethoven where he captures visceral rhythms. Rhythm before Beethoven came mostly from dance and was elaborated uh, for expressive reasons. But in Beethoven, it comes from a psychological understanding of emotion and from a visceral sense of uh, how it feels when you're furious or how it feels when you're having a spasm of rage. So what he puts in there does not exist before this, which is a, an amazing polyrhythm. You have four in the viola and three in the first violin. And again, you barely hear it. It's so violent. It goes by so quickly. But it's there because the conflict of the four against three, uh, which we should hear in again in a moment, that conflict is visceral. It's how it feels when your stomach hurts, you know, to, to have those things churning away like that. Also, uh, 
something that I haven't mentioned yet, but it's uh, kind of obvious, is that these, we don't have a, an opening and a second theme the way you normally expect here. You have them mixed together. The first theme never goes away. The muttering of the first theme is, is permeates the second theme. Because if you think of it as Lichnowsky and Beethoven having an argument, they talk at the same time. Lichnof Lich Ugh, I hate saying that name. <laughs> Lichnowsky is trying to get Beethoven to calm down while Beethoven is outraged. So they must happen at the same time. And the muttering and the attempt to get away from this uh, mood, if they don't happen at the same time, we have a kind of fake, sonata form, classicized, uh, sanitized emotion. With Beethoven, there's no such thing as that. It's as raw as can be. So his technique that pushes and pushes at what composition can be, pushes a composition in order to express things as realistically as music can. That's why it's important to, to know that music means something, because there's a sense of emotional reality that gives way to new compositional ideas. This piece was so experimental in his mind that there's, it's well known that he said this was not written for audiences, this was not meant to be performed in public. There was a group of connoisseurs, and that meant a handful of his closest friends, a few musicians, maybe five or six people. We don't know how many people exactly. And he didn't care that it would ever be played in public because this was an experiment in compositional structure, which is why he could also put so much in such a, to such a short space of time because he was compressing all these thoughts. Um, <clears throat> let's just hear slowly the same thing, 34, 35, 36, 37, all the way through, again, 38, 39, so we can hear really clearly things like that, and also, I mean, Of course, that's slow, we lose a lot of the drama. Tempo is important, but that's great. Um, now, when it shifts into A major, there's a, a simple thing going on there that could have been made much more palatable if he wanted to, which is this is an enharmonic um, modulation. Enharmonic is a very important word at cocktail parties, <laughs> dinner parties. I mean, if you know the word enharmonic and you throw it around, you know, you get a lot of points <laughs> because so few people know it. Uh, of course, this is being streamed live uh, and can be watched later, so many more people will know enharmonic <laughs> than you think. Okay, but they won't remember. Now, what happens is we have this chord, and it should go, or, but it goes. The surprise is because Beethoven is redefining A flat as G sharp. But if he wanted to make that clear, like he does in some earlier pieces, and like Robert Schumann does, he could have put an E, for example, in the cello. Could you play the same passage and just put an E, just play that uh, bar 37 and 38 and play a low E in the cello? You see what's gonna happen. 34? Yeah. Oh, oh. I just, you just need, uh, just 37, okay. that's good. That doesn't, uh, you see what I mean? It, that changes everything. That's why Beethoven didn't do that. Did he know he could have? Let me explain this one more time. That <laughs> Beethoven is taking this chord and going, but if he could have made it clear what the harmonic trick is if he put one other note in, uh, but he doesn't. And he has that opportunity all over the place. And there's something beautiful about being able to do that and a lot of composers would, would signal to you that they're doing an enharmonic modulation by putting in the harmony that makes you hear that note differently, and it's a beautiful moment, but it, it's not what Beethoven wants, so he sacrifices um, its cohesion. He sacrifices some comprehensibility for the shock value. So in other words, he could have a But by leaving it out, and then there's this outrageous scale of A, Silence, and we, and we start our backtracking again. Okay, I think what we need to do 
Oh, well, I must say something else. <laughs> after this, after the octaves in C, he immediately goes to an unexpected key, G flat, where in F minor we go up to G flat. Now, one could go on and on about what that means, but it's also true that Beethoven loved to do that whenever he was in F minor. So any explanation of it has to take into account that there are things composers just like to do. And maybe it's because it means something to him all the time, but it also is a great sound. And for example, in the uh, Appassionata Sonata, which begins like this, the one that he carried in the rain and the snow, very next thing after the silence is G flat. It's exactly the same. This is a little more shocking in the quartet because instead of going from F minor up a half step, he goes from F minor to the dominant and then to G. That's worse. He, I'm sure he knew that. It's worse because the dominant of the key, C major, is a tritone away from G flat and if you know your uh, um, religious history of intervals, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you would know that, but, and if you know all the myths and true stories also about the Council of Trent and all these things, the, the um, tritone is called the Diabolus in Musica. It was called that by the, who else? The Catholic Church. Um, I mean, uh, nobody else calls intervals, you know, devil, uh, devils and things like that, as far as I know. I could be wrong. Um, but <laughs> it has a, an, a terrifying quality. Why does it have a terrifying quality? Good question. It has a terrifying quality <laughs> because it is as far away as you can get. We have 12 notes in, in the Western scale. 12, that's all we have, 12 notes. If that's alarming to you, we can talk about it later. <laughs> There's a lot of literature on it. But anyway, so halfway from, from 1 to 12 is 6. That sounded like 7 to you, but that's if you have 7, there are how many spaces? There are 6 spaces. <laughs> I don't know how else to do that. <laughs> but, so, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The tritone. Uh, is very powerful and it gives people chills even today. If you put two tritones together, you get a diminished seventh chord. Some of you know. <laughs> people who've taken this course for a long time know that the diminished seventh chord is the scariest chord there is according to Beethoven. He uses it throughout this piece whenever he wants incredible drama. And that was what you had here in Coriolan. And another one. Why are they so scary? Because they have true two tritones. And why are two tritones so scary? Because, as you know, it can resolve many ways. It is ambiguous. It has many possibilities. It can resolve eight ways, at least, that are equally good. So it has suspense. The tritone is what gives West Side Story its kick, right? That's the tritone. Uh, but if you re invert these three notes, you also get Here's your West Side Story lecture. Somebody asked for this. <laughs> um, also, it's cool. The tritone does a lot. Um, <clears throat> so when Beethoven goes to the, from F minor to C and then to G flat, it's about the most scary way that, that he can do that. Now, <clears throat> then we have the muttering, and then we have... We're going up the chromatic scale. And we end, up, it, we end up in D flat major. Now, it doesn't matter if you remember that D flat major is not the relative major of F minor or whether you know that, it doesn't matter. What's important is that Beethoven tends to, from here on in his music, and a, a little before, go to less expected keys. He's, he's boundary breaking, he's changing some of the rules about what keys you can go to. Uh, not that, it, not that there were rules, but there were tendencies that were very profound and that most composers stuck to as syntax, as grammar. So if you think of it not as rules imposed by a theory teacher, but as rules the way grammar has rules. So if you say something and the grammar or the syntax is off, people may wonder what you mean. 
They don't know what exactly what you're saying. And grammar and syntax evolve through usage. And Beethoven's use of grammar, musical grammar, totally altered the way people composed and thought about music. And this piece is an extreme example of that. Um, <clears throat> so let's go a little further <laughs> in this piece, because we could get stuck there. What starts to happen is this idea of moving enharmonically <laughs> to a foreign key happens many times. And each time, he could have done something as simple as that. But by not doing that, it, it re retains its sense of terror. Um, how about playing from the beginning up until the development starts? So ending, you know, stopping there, bar, uh, stopping at the end of 59. So now you're going to hear uh, a lot of what we've talked about. But bear in mind that the muttering, doodle -doodle -dum, which comes from the opening, never stops. The key changes are unusual. The enharmonic shifts are always violent in new keys followed by silence. And eventually we come to the end of the exposition and it's quite calm. The exposition simply is when, uh, that's the part of a, a sonata structure in which you meet the characters, you hear the themes, it's the opening. It's the beginning uh, after which there is a development. It's like any story. You have to have the characters, you have to meet the themes, you have to understand what the material is. But Beethoven intertwines this material and it's already in a highly developed state before the so-called development section. So up to there. <coughs> <coughs> So unlike most sonata forms, most symphonies, most quartets by Haydn and Mozart, or even by Beethoven, that ending of an exposition is not an ending. There's no repeat. It doesn't come to any kind of conclusion. It just moves on. This is partly because the form is so compressed. Also, when you have such a violent and compact, intense exposition, you can't repeat it. You can't, you can't do it again. Uh, it would make no sense whatsoever. In fact, he knows that so well that when the recapitulation comes, which is a design element simply to review the music that came back after it's been developed, and the main point of the, of the, ex uh, sorry, of the recapitulation is to stay somehow in the tonic key, in the main key, whether it's F minor or F major, to stay in F. He knows that he can't repeat it. So a huge section of that exposition is cut out. That's very unusual. Well, you'll hear that when we get to it. So. <coughs> By the way, another little thing that I heard just now that I want to mention is after you hear this, and then it goes, we get that far. The next note would be that, and that's where, that's what happens later. Don't you like that? I like that. So, so B, F, G flat, G, and then it goes to A. 
And eventually the A goes to A, so he keeps it going. And he keeps it going over a long line. And I think if you, sh I mean, I just heard that as a very exciting moment, so I'm sharing it with you. Okay, <laughs> um, now, uh, also, when he gets to the top of the scale, he goes to D. And the second time he breaks out, it's in D itself, but he doesn't go, he doesn't do that. And the reason is, if you think of it, uh, harmonically there's a reason, he doesn't want to go past that. But both of these outbursts, even though they're in different keys, come back to the same resolution. The first one goes, and this one, even though it's different, it, it, it goes back to the exact same notes, the same thing. That instills again, like the Coriolan Overture, the sense of being trapped. You can burst out in A major, you can burst out in D major, but you're not going anywhere. You're not even changing key, you're stuck there. There's a sense of oppression, of almost being in a jail cell, like in Fidelio, and that you can rage chromatically, you can open up the keys, you can try to find another way out, but you won't. And so these little details, like that extra note at the top of the rung, and then taking it away and being in a different key, they really are powerful when you realize that the resolution is the same. And it's just like an escape plan, it doesn't work. You just don't get out. So then when this ends, the exposition, we would expect perhaps, because that's, that would be a good key to go to. It would be messy for him. Or um, if it went to major, it really would be strange. But of course, it can, it has to be both a surprise and correct. It needs to be a surprise and inevitable, which is the phrase that people use in, in music to, I, I'm not sure who started that phrase, the surprising and the inevitable together. So what he does is this. And that is F major. It is the major version of the key we're in, F minor. And it's a surprise, but it feels right. And because Beethoven plans ahead and also revises and reworks and reworks and reworks, he made that decision for two reasons. One is bec what I said, because it's a surprise, but it also makes sense. But the other is if you, in the recapitulation, if you reversed the decision and you're in F, the dominant of F, and you go to D flat. In other words, if you re reverse the system that he set up there, the, the relationship, you have a standard cadence that feels right, much more right. In other words, he went from an outrageous chord progression, inverted it, and got something stable and normal. And I'm sure he knew that. Um, <clears throat> now, to move on a little bit, what starts to happen in the, in the, in the development section is quite a few diminished seventh chords. I'm, let, me, let me see if I have time to say something about diminished seven chords. <laughs> Let's see, 1992. Okay, I do. <laughs> um, basically, I just want to, for those of you who have not heard the diminished seventh chords, first of all, where have you been? <laughs> no, but, but secondly, a diminished seventh chord, if you, if you lower any one tone, it becomes a dominant seventh in some key. So there are four keys right there. They each could have been minor. Who would like to try that? <laughs> no, right, okay. Um, but basically, because of that, it has a huge amount of tension. Beethoven himself called it the most terrifying chord. Uh, and it was. So that happens quite a few times. And also the octaves that we heard in the, uh, at the beginning. There are lots of octaves here. And yes, he was hyper octave. This is well known. OK. Oh, a terrible joke. OK. And then, uh, but then after this very brief, everything's very compressed. So it's so compressed that after this development section is tiny. And it's mostly diminished seventh chords looking for a way out. But that's the feeling. It's always looking for a way out. So diminished seventh chords have 
built in this feeling that you have options, but they don't work in this piece. The, none of them actually work. You don't get out. And then, when you get to the recapitulation, finally, <coughs> when you get here, you expect no. You no, as I said, you're not going to go back. Beethoven will not repeat all that music that you heard because it doesn't work. And that's one of the main experiments of this first movement, is that you can't have a repeat of the first section, you can't have a normal recapitulation, because the material was so specifically dramatic that to repeat it, is me it makes no sense. It ruins this. It's like you can't have that happen again, just like in a story, you can't tell that part again. And I think that he probably was very frustrated with that formalism of repeating a section. And he started to realize more and more, we know from the fact that he Instead of repeating sections, he started to write first and second endings that would be different. Then eventually, here, he gets rid of the possibility of a repeat, and you get more through composed storytelling, more narrative structure that just goes forward, it never looks back. And so he cuts out 15 measures of music, which you'll notice. Um, it's interesting to notice something missing, but you will. And then, there's an abrupt key change that is a lot like a filmmaker making a splice. We have to play this for them so we can hear this. If we start at um, first, the first time it happens, if we can play from... My only hesitation is the size of the numbers, 22, 23, 24, bar 24, up to the, down, the end of 28. And then we're going to play a similar passage. This is at the beginning of the piece now. You, you've already heard this. Okay, and now we play the same exact spot in the recapitulation, and you will hear a splice. We used to call it a splice. It's called an edit now. Um, starting the equivalent spot, which I guess you could call Whatever that is, you see the number. Go ahead. Yeah, it just, it just, right in the middle of the phrase, it just shifts into another key. And, and he doesn't prepare it the way he might. He doesn't write an extended set of phrases. It just shifts. It's beautiful. In other words, he has to do that, though, because this whole movement is so compressed. Everything is so short that he cuts out things that don't need saying again, and he edits things together and presses them very much. Um, I, I have to share with you David Finkel's comment about this movement. Uh, this is his, not mine. He said, it's like taking one of those dogs and smushing it together and you get a pug dog. <laughs> <coughs> I mean, it, ha it has some validity. Okay, all right, now. Um, so after that, it shifts key, and Beethoven tries to maintain F, the key of F, for a very long time. And it breaks out like it did before, but something slightly different. If we could play, uh, I say we, but I'm not actually playing, uh, at bar 103 up until, you know, Now, you have to notice something very tricky. He doesn't do this. He goes, right? There's an extra note. And he does that again later. He goes, instead of going, he goes, he adds an extra note because he needs to stay in certain keys for the structure. Because even though this piece is outrageous and it's about rage and it's about fury and breaking boundaries and trying to escape, it has to have the logic that makes the key structures possible that he has set up for himself. The, gra the grammar that he broke away from, fine. The grammar that he sets up, he has to keep. So he needs to instill those extra notes th so that he stays in the circle of fifths, basically. He has to stay in this area of D, G, and C to get back to F. Otherwise, he'd be very far away, which he might have liked earlier in the piece. But if he gets that far away harmonically at the end, he can't go back in a short space of time. 
So what you have is a perfect balance of logic and kind of wildness. Uh, it's the perfect balance of um, imagination and tradition, you know, of the intellect and intuition. The intuition helps write the piece originally, but the intellect then edits the piece, helps mold it, and brings it back. That's the creative process always, but here it's just at such a clear, vivid level of control where he first creates a structure where things disrupt themselves, interrupt themselves, and erupt in strange directions, and then he pulls himself back and does something that's still an exciting solution to the problem. But the solution is based on the fact that he needs to stay somewhat within a grammar that works. Mozart, bef before Beethoven, obviously, had said in a, in a letter to his father <coughs> that even uh, violence in an opera still has to sound like music, <laughs> which <coughs> may be obvious, but it's not that obvious uh, all the time to everybody, you know. And every time an envelope is pushed, you know, by somebody, that question comes up. Is it music? I actually had that question asked of me recently, not about Beethoven. Well, it wasn't about any piece in particular. But uh, I was talking to a group of kids, and there were some adults who, were, who had come with them. And I said, to, a to answer the question, what is dissonance? That dissonance is instability and a need to resolve. It's something that either needs resolution or that feels like it might need resolution or something that creates a kind of tension. That's it. Nothing, it's not, you know, and there I could see people thinking, wait a minute, isn't it bad or something? <laughs> <laughs> you know, is, and, and then, therefore, consonance is resolution or stability. So the adult in the room raised his hand and said, can't you have so much dissonance that it's not music anymore? And I just loved that question because it shows you, I mean, the kids were completely open to the concept, but there was already a huge judgment being passed, you know, on, on what dissonance is. That judgment has hit every composer who has, who has um, pushed the envelope of composition from time immemorial. And uh, there are letters about from Monteverdi back and forth about this and Jeswaldo going into you know, the Renaissance, and, and Bach even. Uh, and you know, with Beethoven, it was a huge thing. And he knew how far he could do certain compositional things in a public piece. That's why this outrageous piece he considered not public. And he still was capable of writing things like Wellington's Victory, which might as well have been a movie score. You know, I don't mean that in a bad way. I do, actually. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there are good movie scores, but that's not what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so, then this piece basically dies out and mutters away, which is also shocking, because he easily could have done one of these, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sort of. I mean, he could, it, it's a furious piece. And he could have had one last diminished chord, you know, um, <laughs> something. But instead, it dies out and it just fades away. It, it, it's partly because, for him, that's the reality of what happened. The story he's telling, whatever it is, maybe it's because at that point he had slammed the door, taken his appassionata, marched out into the snow, and he's walking and thinks, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> I have to walk in snow and rain all the way to this town you know, and, and so he's walking into the, or maybe it's a picture of him walking into the distance. But whatever it is, the sense of exhaustion is amazing because that is not an ending you hear very often in this period. Uh, and it's, it is basically a signal that an ending, it doesn't have to be what it normally is. Of course, it's not the end of the whole piece. And the end of the whole piece is also shocking. So uh, I think what we should do, since you guys are prepared to play the whole piece, obviously, right, is... I'll say a few things about a few other spots in the rest of the movement, and then we'll hear the entire thing, okay? That's kind of unusual and exciting. Um, can you play the opening of the second movement? Okay, that's enough, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, it's in D major, 
And I, have I like to read, after I do my own thoughts about this, I like to read what everybody has to say about this. And I was very disappointed because most of the things you read say the second movement's in D major. How did he ever come up with that? In fact, listen to this. This is from a very famous book. Of course, it's quite an old book, but so was Beethoven. And this says, the key chosen for the second movement of this quartet may well astonish us. It is very rare with Beethoven, usually so respectful of natural musical law. I don't even know what that means, but anyway. To find in a work in F minor a movement in D major, an entirely unrelated key, we can explain this anomaly only by the frequency in which in this work of keys containing G flat which become F sharp, this may excuse incursions into those keys. Now, there are a lot of G flats becoming F sharps. That happens a lot. But D major, he hit it so many times in the first movement. You heard it. You know, he, he goes to A, and there's your D, and then later, whoop, to D major. Uh, he, he lands on D many, many times and on D major, and the D there and the D, there's a D infused in the first movement that is looking for uh, expression, and it's a perfect place to put it. But not only that, the theme that you just heard, which hardly sounds like a theme. There it is again. Whoops. It's the same thing in a different key. In fact, if I add two notes to the front of this theme, I get... But he didn't have those two notes, you, you say. But I say they're suppressed <laughs> by the Metternich Empire. <laughs> okay, so, um, but it, it really is there. That, it again, is a fifth and a fourth, and it turns on that same interval. So it's a reference to the first movement, and the key is a reference to all those Ds and all those D scales and, and A scales, which is the dominant of D, and G scales, which is the subdominant of D. All of them are there, and so that's why he goes to this key. It's begging to go to this key. Now, <coughs> this uh, has a very beautiful spot that's quite famous. Could, could you guys, uh, I'll play it without the second violin, and then you play it the way it's supposed to be. This is a passage. out just the second violin part. Now let's hear it with the second violin part. It's quite different. Okay, so uh, you have to ask, why do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, what I like, <laughs> what I, <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, what I, what I like about that is that it's only in one part. I love that, because if he had divided the chord up in the quartet differently, it would just be a harmonic statement. But because it's one instrument, it has, again, the sense of this individual sort of being trapped in the harmony. You know, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And what you have there is, uh, it would be, without the second violin, a perfectly normal cadence on D and then G minor. But this makes it diminished seven, and that makes it, a, a, if you add a, a root to the bottom of the diminished seventh chord, you get a dominant minor ninth. Even, even if you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, haven't you ever gone to a, a science lecture where you understand 80% of it and it's enough? Okay. So am I not supposed to talk about why there's global warming? I mean, okay, whatever. <laughs> so basically, uh, the diminished seventh chord is created on the top, and the root note makes it a dominant minor ninth, and it resolves supposedly here. This is what's great. The dominant minor ninth should resolve like this. And it does, except the second violin won't let it. So it's subverted several times. It's just a great passage. Um, a great use of the diminished sevens. Then we get a fugue. 
out of nowhere. Um, <coughs> well, except it's here. It's a great fugue subject. It comes, it's drawn out of the opening music, which you will hear. But then later in the second movement comes, I don't have to analyze the fugue, it's, it's, we don't have time for all of that, but the next passage is much stranger than anything else in this movement. This passage, you must know what I, I'm probably building to, it's the one that starts. This passage is very strange because it's built on that opening, descending motif, and he goes through different keys, and they are they in relationship to each other. These keys are moving down in whole tones, which for that time is an absolutely bizarre, talk about, um, what, it, what was the phrase that this person used? Uh, natural musical law, an anomaly. Okay, it, I'm sure, I didn't read it as far to see what he says about this particular chord progression, but uh, this is quite disturbing in a beautiful way, though, because its complication, its strangeness is what makes it beautiful. In fact, uh, Walter Pater, a philosopher uh, who wrote about romanticism a lot, said that beauty must have strangeness in it. And he was talking about romanticism. It's a great concept. Um, don't decide if you agree or not. Just don't do that. <laughs> Just think about it, okay? <laughs> Um, so let's hear this passage and then we'll take a look at it. Right, it's, it's quite remarkable in its strangeness, and how simple, it's, he's just doing a simple sequence of uh, scale progression with some standard harmonies, but because each time it repeats, it drops a whole tone, it almost foreshadows 19, late 19th century, early 20th century chord progressions, it's so strange. Um, and then, after that chord, we get, what note do we get? And if we put those together, which he didn't, it sounds really strange after that, but that would have been a dominant minor ninth. In other words, he separates the ninth from the chord, but that's the chord that infected from the second violin earlier on. It comes back and starts the whole fugue again, and the fugue this time has accompaniments in it, which are quite beautiful. So did he place those chords there without following through? Never. Every time Beethoven does anything, it is followed through completely. It's, that's the whole essence of his technique. Any suggestion is followed through. <coughs> so then we have the fugue with an accompaniment, which is quite beautiful. Then we have to take a look a little bit at the uh, third movement, which is the one that is called Allegro assai vivace ma serioso, and this is called the Serioso Quartet. Uh, it seems that Serioso isn't really an Italian word. Uh, there's a little arguing about that, but it's pretty much not. Um, <laughs> it's one of those Beethoven mistakes. Uh, he was very bad with even German. Um, <laughs> people disagree whether his German was bad or he was just so fast when he talked and so sloppy when he wrote that nobody could understand him. And even Fur Elise, it's actually Fur Teresa, but they couldn't read it. <laughs> you know, it's really, he's, no, I'm not kidding. It's so sloppy, it's unbelievable. Okay, um, and then he wrote famously about his copyist, mistakes, mistakes, you are yourself a singular mistake. <laughs> uh, let's just hear the, the very opening up until, you know, up into the low C of the third movement. Okay, great. So again, the silences and the outbursts, and this, this develops really very powerfully. What's one of the interesting things about that rhythm is that the beginning of the last movement, if you could just play the fourth movement, the first phrase, 
the very fir just the first gesture. That is the same thing as paparirang, but very slow. <laughs> so it's the same rhythm, augmented, we call it, or slow down unbelievably. It, you, you kind of recognize it, and, and you kind of don't. You have to think about it. And again, for Beethoven, it was uh, a matter of integrity to refer back to it in this sort of memory. Like It's almost as if paparirang had happened, it's gone, and then in a reflective pensive, sadder moment, he recalls that and it's very slow and it's almost unrecognizable, as memory often is. Um, a couple of important things. F, when we had this, this business of F going up a half step is extremely important throughout this entire composition. So why don't we play from bar 37 into the second ending. And you'll hear how F goes to G flat, and go a little further so we hear what happens there. So is bar, th is that 37? Yeah. Great, great, thank you. And, and so you hear that here, there's a trio section. This is kind of a, a scherzo, a violent scherzo with these gentle trios, and there are two trios, so it's five sections. These, these um, are linked by the same F to G flat. It's like a trigger. It happens over and over throughout the piece. In fact, the most remarkable one is at the very end of the entire piece, where we have an F major chord and then an F sharp, and it takes us into the coda. Can you maybe just give us a little inkling of the F majors going into the final allegro without going too far. So from E, it's bar, I can't see the bar number on this. <coughs> okay, don't give it away. <laughs> see, but there, instead of starting in F major, he, which he does go into F major, but it's that note is so important that he uses now an F sharp to have this brilliant ending. You know, people have written a lot about this ending. How come after this huge dramatic piece with some beautiful music but so much anger, there's this coda that sounds so wonderful and uplifting and brief and, and celebratory. It sounds like Mendelssohn a little bit, you know, but of course it's before Mendelssohn, so Mendelssohn was sounding like Beethoven. But um, people have written different things about it. It's very interesting. One common thought is that the piece is about oppression and this is freedom. It's fine. Another, though, is that Beethoven, which he does in Opus 135, is also saying this seriousness is not the only way to live your life. You have to let it go, which I think is even more profound. In other words, he's thinking you can't dwell on your misery all the time. It's you have to live life, which he decided many, many times. I don't know which one is right. You pick the one you like better or come up with another one and mail it to um, David Finkel. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> let's see. Now, the only other thing I want to point out is in the slow movement, there are some references, not the slow movement, sorry, in the fourth movement, there are some references to the first movement. If you just pay, play bar 19, 20, and 21, you'll hear, remember this? And things like that. Here it is in a different movement, in a different way. It's the same thing. That's a ridiculous place to start, I know. Uh, you want to start a bar before that? Yeah, so it's really from the other movement. And then there are some of the most powerful diminished seventh chords in all of music, finally. <laughs> um, and let's see, bar 30. Let's see. Ah, there we go. This is so tiny. 30, 31, th 32, 33, 34. You know, those diminished chords up through, let's say, 39, where we have, uh, starting in the middle of the bar, where we have. Okay, 
And that shows you what a diminished seventh chord does. It tears open the, har the fabric of the harmony. I think we are now ready to hear this entire thing. In fact, we better. <laughs> are, you, are you warmed up enough? <laughs> yeah, oh, sure. Okay. Does everyone have their score and pencil to mark all the mistakes that <laughs> No, right? <laughs> okay, I'll sit in the back. The Danish String Quartet.
because it's late, I have to say one last thing, which did you hear? <laughs> did you hear at the very end when all of it stopped and you heard? Remember this? And all that's that's that same DNA from the beginning. <laughs> it comes back at the very end. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>